Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and in Jerry Foundation are so excited to be with you here today to kick off another exciting semester of live stream webinar events. In this month's series, we dive into everything uh, marine science and explore what's happening in the field, interesting careers related to marine science and more. And today we're talking with Peter Chai Bongzai, Director of Conservation Programs at the Billfish, Billfish Foundation. He'll be talking with us about important billfishes in the ocean, uh, the ocean system, and worldwide efforts to study and conserve these populations. But first, we'd like to tell you a quick little bit about our programs. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program that's housed within the University of Florida's Thompson Earth Systems Institute. We have a mission to engage Florida K-12 teachers and students in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today that will hopefully inspire future stewards of our planet. The Injury Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education, and many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV Injury. And in case you missed any of the information in today's preview slides, we'd like to remind you that you can submit questions for our scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also be providing a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to get some cool swag. So we hope that you will take part in that as well. So at this time, I'd like to introduce to you our scientist. I'm going to go ahead and stop share here. Peter Chai Bongzai. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, about his work, and why it's so important. So Peter, we're going to turn things over to you at this time. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Hopefully they can. Um, so as Stephanie was saying, um, my name is Peter Taibongzai. I'm with the Billfish Foundation. I I'm originally from the great state of New Jersey, uh, but I now reside down here in South Florida. Uh, I've been down here for nearly half my life at this point. Uh, I went to school at the University of Miami, uh, Rosenstiel School. I'm actually a double alum. I went there for not only my undergraduate, but my graduate school. And um, it's can't say that I could have gone to a better school. It was one of the best decisions of my life, uh, to be honest. It's actually also where I met my wife. Uh, so there's that as well. Um, but anyway, um, so I'm here to talk about Billfish. And the title of my talk uh, is Billfish. Do I know you from somewhere? Um, and it'll get into the whole aspect of uh, the conservation efforts that our foundation is doing currently. But I wanted to first give you guys, uh, everyone in the audience, an opportunity to familiarize yourself with it. And it actually might be more familiar to you than some of you actually realize. And I'll get into that in one second. But before I really start, I want to first thank the Anjari Foundation as well as the University of Florida for having me to be able to talk about some of the work that we do. And I really hope that everyone that's listening in can take something away from it, either something really interesting from the fish, uh, the family of fish that I'll be talking about, or some of the conservation efforts that we're doing, as well as maybe understanding that you can make a difference. Um, so um, before, like I said, we get into the conservation efforts itself, I wanna get into uh, giving you a little bit of detail of these family of fish. And with that, I wanna show you some, just some illustrations of what some look like. Uh, and here are some examples of billfish that you can see. Um, the one on the left is a blue marlin. The one on the right is a white marlin. That's one example. Uh, and then here are two more examples. That's a striped marlin on the left and a sailfish on the right. Now, I know I don't think I can get questions or answers from the audience right now, but maybe within the chat, you guys, uh, maybe if you guys could see what are some of the things or what's some of the features, the physiological, physiological features that you would see that are similar with all billfish species. I'll give you guys about 10 seconds if, if that's all right.
I'll go back to the other one. I'll go back to this one. Now, just to keep ourselves on time, the biggest factor that we see, or the biggest thing that we see, the diff uh, the similarities are um, what they have, what we call their bills, their rostrums, essentially. And the rostrums are used for a multitude of different reasons. Uh, they are used to not only catch and uh, stun their prey, but what's really cool about uh, billfish as well, uh, and the rostrum or the nose, uh, some of them call it a Pinocchio nose, uh, is the fact that it helps these fish become hydrodynamic. And what that means is it makes them go faster in the water. And the way it does that is really cool to where it add, actually adds more water to go through their mouth and through their gills. So it allows more oxygen to go through, uh, go through there as well. It's a really interesting fun fact that a lot of people don't know. So, and now you know. Um, so billfish in themselves, um, like I said, there are some similarities. Uh, the body shape is, is fairly similar as well as the, as the nose. Um, they are important because they are apex predators and apex predators basically means they're at the top of the food chain and they help regulate uh, the, rest of the rest of the food web. Okay. Um, they are also really important to our community here um, in the in Florida as well as lots of lots of other communities uh, because they are prized and important game fish and game fish just for you to understand game fish are a species that uh, recreational fishermen go out uh, to catch and in this case 99 percent of the time release and so they catch and release these fish and lots of people <laughs> Uh, actually pay a lot of money just to see these fish. Um, we've done a number, of, a number of research on where, um, I don't know how many of you out there have actually gone fishing before. You know, maybe you've gone uh, snapper fishing, grouper fishing. Maybe some of you guys have gone dorado fishing or uh, mahi-mahi fishing. Uh, but when people go out for billfish, uh, you know, they are typically going a little bit further. They're using different kinds of methods to catch them. And typically that's a little bit more expensive. So we've seen in some of our research that um, they uh, are our community uh, of recreational uh, anglers typically will pay a lot more money to, to see these fish out there. And we want to make sure that those communities that are dependent on these healthy fisheries are sustained and promoted as well as thrive, essentially. Um, so the next question is what threats are they facing? Um, if, if I just told you that um, most of the time these fish are caught, uh, caught and released uh, alive, what threats are they facing? Well, unfortunately, due to, their, uh, due to where they are in the open water um, and where they're found sometimes, they are caught as bycatch. And for some of you, uh, you might know what that means, but for those of you that don't know what that means, it means like uh, you might, you caught something by accident. You weren't looking to get that, but by accident you caught, uh, you, uh, you, you, excuse me, by accident you caught those fish. Um, and billfish tend to be a huge, um, huge factor there when being caught accidentally. And we are trying as a foundation to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and we work with a number of uh, groups to make sure that we can minimize that. Um, and that typically isn't the case here in the United States, but more uh, abroad. Now, some of you might ask, where do you find billfish? Well, um, you can find them everywhere. It's colored in yellow, orange, and red. Red are the areas to where you can see them the most. And you can see that they are found in lots of places. Uh, most of the time, uh, you know, they are, they are found in tropical, subtropical and temperate waters. Um, I've been lucky enough through my position at the Billfish Foundation to be able to travel to a lot of these places all over the world, from Costa Rica to Bermuda to Japan. Uh, all over the place, but they're found in Australia, Africa, South America, Canada. Um, it's really amazing to see what these fish can do and what, um, where they live. It's, it truly is amazing. Um, 
And this is an example of one of them, uh, a live, a, a live look, uh, not a live look, excuse me, a picture of them. This is, believe it or not, um, as big as I get. Um, they are some of the biggest fish out there. They can grow to over 12 feet in length, uh, can be nearly a ton, which is nearly 2000 pounds. And they are the world's fastest fish. Uh, my, uh, my son likes to say they're an ocean cheetah, um, specifically the sailfish. Uh, they have been, uh, they are considered the fastest fish in the water where they can go nearly 65 miles per hour or higher, uh, which is crazy. And what's even crazier to think about is the fact that they start out as little, little guys. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that later. And one of the campaigns that we've got going on, one of our uh, research efforts that we're trying to do right now. Um, the other thing is going back to the original title of the, of the uh, presentation is the fact that it's a cultural icon, um, meaning it's in pop culture and lots of people might know and might have seen it, but might not kind of associate the things together. Um, what I mean by that is for those of you in middle school or high school, you might have read or will be reading Old Man in the Sea from Ernest Hemingway, a very popular book. Um, also, uh, it's also in clothing apparel, uh, like uh, it's in some Columbia gear or Pelagic gear. These are all apparel companies, Tommy Bahama. Um, but if you're from South Florida, like I am, um, there might be one major league team that utilizes them as a mascot. I'll give you about five to 10 seconds maybe and see if any of you know who they are. Does anybody know? Does anybody know what mascot from a major league team would be it? All right, excellent. It looks like Aaron yeah, all right. It looks like, yeah, Aaron and Patricia got it. Yeah, Billy the Marlin. That's exactly it. Our own Billy the Marlin is a billfish. And I still remember to this day going to the park and being so excited that there's actually a billfish uh, as a mascot. Um, and what's always so funny is a lot of people that go to the games don't put two and two together. Then they don't see the uh, uh, don't see why they're, why the mascot is called Billy, which I always find funny. Um, but, um, so going back to now going to the conservation aspect of things, why do we know so little about these species? If they're so loved by, by our community, by the recreational fishing community, and there's a foundation like myself that, that wants to, to learn more. Well, there's something called a rare event species, which means they're not really found that often. Um, and as I was saying before, uh, they're not caught for consumption. It's not like a tuna uh, or it's not like a dorado or mahi-mahi or grouper. Uh, they're not caught for consumption or to be eaten uh, by, the hum uh, by, by humans, at least here in the United States. And it's one of the reasons why our foundation was formed. Um, back in the eighties, uh, I know, uh, way before a lot of you were born, uh, our foundation was formed by scientists, fishing clubs, as well as the general public to learn more about these species, just because it was so beloved by so many people for so long, but not many people knew about them. So our foundation was formed by, like I said, a number of individuals uh, to learn more about these species. And uh, like I said, I'll be talking about two uh, campaign specifically that we're doing, or research campaigns that we're a part of, one of them being our cornerstone project, our cornerstone program, to where we can learn more about these species. Now, before I get into that, I just want to give you just a short synopsis of my foundation. Uh, we're called the Billfish Foundation, and obviously, like I said, uh, we study billfish, and our sole mission is to uh, conserve billfish populations worldwide, as well as promote and conserve uh, the communities that are dependent on those fisheries being healthy. Um, lots of people are dependent on these healthy fisheries and we wanna make sure that 
that is sustained for a long, long time before, uh, you know, for our great grandkids and our great, great grandkids, we want to make sure that everyone has the same opportunity. Uh, as I said, our, our foundation was formed in the, in the mid 80s, 1986, and our cornerstone program, which I'm going to be talking about in, in more depth, was established in 1990. And uh, I'll, I'll get into what that is exactly in a second, but uh, this program has been uh, incredibly successful because it's what we call citizen science. Essentially, it's that at its finest, um, where we can have anybody, anyone like, like you in the classroom, or uh, if you and your father, you and your mother go out on a boat and go out fishing and encounter one of these fish, you have the opportunity to provide us data that helps us understand more about these fish. And that's quite rare. I mean, not as rare as it used to be, uh, but with that, and because of this program over 30 years now, uh, we have over 280,000 tag and release records globally. You saw that billfish are found everywhere. And uh, we've been really blessed to have over 100,000 people participate in the program since it started, which is kind of mind blowing to think, uh, at least for me. <clears throat> um, and what's really interesting about it is that uh, most people, uh, or excuse me, a majority of what we know about billfish and their whole um, history, life history comes from tagging programs like, like ours, which is quite amazing to think about. <clears throat> And so we owe a lot to uh, the people who participate in the program. Now, this is a picture of a tag and it's not super fancy, but it gets the job done. And <clears throat> you'll, I'll be able to show you it to more to scale a little bit later. But as you can see uh, on the back of the tag has an ID number and that basically gives uh, that fish a number for someone um, when they, when they go ahead and tag the fish that has a number, they report all the information on a card or on a app for us. And then if someone recaptures that fish, that tagged fish, uh, that person would then report that back to us. And all of this is incredibly useful. Um, the only thing about this sometimes being an issue is because we're utilizing the general public as a, um, as a resource basically, Sometimes there are some uh, things that could be mistaken. Uh, like sometimes, as I was showing you before, some of those fish kind of look similar, right? Well, that happens out on the water. Think about a fish, you know, moving around so quickly and you're trying to cut the leader off and, you know, you're trying to also tag the fish and you're trying to identify at the same time. Sometimes misidentification happens and there's some errors, but the pros well out see the cons. Uh, there's more benefit to it because we, now have such a good amount of data that come in that our scientists can then analyze and work with that it far exceeds that. And the fact of the matter that we're utilizing the individuals that encounter these fish at a higher rate than if you were to get scientists just to go out one by one, uh, it just saves on time, money, and really manpower. So this this uh, this program really helps us learn so much more about it. And like I said, anyone can participate. And this is an area, um, just kind of giving the tagging 101 spiel right now, is if this was the illustration of a fish, that's the target area, that red area. Uh, I like to call that the shoulder of the fish. And that's basically the target area because that's an area where you will not harm the fish. Um, right now, I'm going to show you um, uh, in the next picture, I'll show you basically where it is deployed properly and what it kind of looks like. So here on the left, you can see uh, someone actually deploying the tag. Um, you can see there's a stick that's here in the water, and that is the tagging stick. And on the end of that tagging stick is a tag. Um, and once again, um, this is what a tag looks like. On the end of that stick, that's what is getting inserted or deployed onto that fish, right on that shoulder blade of the fish. And once the tag stick releases, 
you'll have this nice little piece of jewelry, I like to say, on, uh, on the fish. Uh, think of it as an ear piercing. Um, it doesn't harm the fish and it, gets, it can stay on there for many, many years. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples of that um, uh, later in this presentation of some of the, the lengths and the distances some of these fish have gone. Um, here's just another, another really cool picture of, of a fish being released uh, with a tag in it. If you can see, I'm trying to circle around it, but it's right there, right on that shoulder blade, which is great. Um, if you were to go on Instagram, uh, I'm sure many of you have it. If you were to put in this hashtag, every tag tells a story, that's the hashtag that we use all the time. And the reason this program, which is our cornerstone program, has been so successful over the years is because there's a history with our foundation and there's a trust within our community. Um, we also make our data open to the public. So if you're a scientist out there and you wanted to learn more about, let's say, sailfish here in South Florida, you would contact us and we would then supply it to you for free. Um, it's very open source, so to speak. And we want to get information out there that's really gonna help the community and help the fish. Um, it also really helps out that, as I was saying before, on the end of each of the tags, there's a number on the back. So it identifies the, the fish, right? So with that, it basically gives you a sense of ownership with the fish. So it's almost like if you tag this fish, like this guy tagging this fish, that's his fish. So you have a little bit more of a interest in making sure that one, that fish can be properly released and revived and can swim away well, and then hopefully be recaptured and reported. Um, we also offer prizes for people that catch it um, and we publicize it as well. We really wanna make sure that those people that participate in the program really get the pat on the back uh, that they deserve. Um, <clears throat> so here are some examples uh, from a couple of years ago of some of the recaptures that we've had. And now you can see these fish do not stay still. <laughs> They, uh, they go all over the place. And this is just a very small sample of where some of these fish go. Um, you can see some, excuse me, went to from the Bahamas all the way to the Guadalupe. Some went to Costa Rica, some went outside of Hawaii, um, Jamaica to Cuba. Um, and then here are some sailfish recaptures. Um, and sailfish are the more common species. Uh, they're more, uh, they're more common in the area. And right now is sailfish season. So I don't know if any of you do fish, but now is a great time to go and find a sailfish out in the water. Um, a couple of friends of mine actually caught about five or six of them yesterday. Uh, so it's, it's been really nice out there to catch some of these fish, but you can see, I digress. You can see some of the spots where they're, they're going up and down. And what's really interesting about this is lots of times, um, Many of these fish, original, uh, sorry, many of these fish were thought in certain areas to be localized. Like they could only be found in this area. They didn't travel that far. But um, what we found is that with a lot of these tags that they travel all over the place. Um, I had a colleague of mine who said, oh, you know, they're only found um, like the one in Mexico down on the bottom left. They said, oh, we've only, we think they stay here the entire year. They don't move anywhere. But what was really interesting was that, as you can see here, they travel back and forth uh, from Mexico to Florida. And actually, on one of the trips that I did myself, one of the tags that I deployed or my colleague deployed in, in Mexico was actually recaptured, one off of Miami and the other one off of Cuba, which is crazy. Um, I know we always, I always get excited seeing them because it's always interesting to see, um, you know, all the information about them. Um, and why it's really important for that recapture, uh, recapturing of those tagged fish is because it provides an understanding of how big those fish get within that certain time period, right? So if you caught something last year, seeing how big it gets, it also obviously shows where they're found and their migration patterns uh, during the year. It also helps us understand effort in the area as well as um, seeing really how well the stock is doing. So. It's, or, or the fish are doing. So it's really cool that, at least for me, it's really cool to know that, you know, something as small as, you know, this little tag 
can help provide so much good for not only the fish itself, but for the community that depends on it. Um, just for you guys to understand, like I said, you know, we have um, we have one of the highest recapture rates uh, for for billfish, and we're very proud of that fact. And that's all due to the fact that our community, as well as um, our tags, are very easy to see. Like I said, they're orange and they kind of stick out. Now, here are some other recaptures. Like I said, those are South Florida, but here's some sailfish recaptures off of Costa Rica. There's one here off of Malaysia, another one that was in Australia. Uh, we have a lot of these and it's really, like I said, it's incredible to always see them um, and to see the reactions of some of the guys and, and gals that call us or email us when they capture it, recapture, because they're so excited like we are to see where these fish have come from and um, how they got there uh, and how big they've gotten and so forth. Here's another example of one of the fish that were tagged uh, off my great home state of New Jersey. Now this is a bluefin tuna and I know we're called the Bill Fish Foundation, but we also do um, tag some bluefin tuna once in a while. And what's really cool about this too is that it went transatlantic. It went all the way across the other side of the Atlantic into the Mediterranean Sea. And if you can see, it was at large for 2,672 days. That is nearly 10 years. It is crazy. And to think about how big a group, 37 inches to 94 within that time period is pretty amazing. And the straight line distance, meaning that straight line, like the shortest, uh, the shortest distance was over 4,000 miles. And what's what you have to consider, and I'll show you an example soon, is that these fish don't go in a straight line. They're going all over the place. These tags only do a point A to point B from where they were caught originally to where they were recaptured. Uh, but these fish are like doing like squiggly lines and they're moving all over the place. And it's really cool to try to understand that. Uh, here's another one, but this time it's of a blue marlin that was tagged off of uh, Puerto Rico and recaptured right off the coast of Africa. Uh, it's just, like I said, these fish are amazing. Um, and it always, always gives me a sense of pride to try to learn more about these fish. Um, here's one that's super cool, uh, at least to me. Um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, other fish that I was showing, the, the time period between when it was caught and when it was recaptured or the days at large was a really long time. But this one, was so short. <laughs> I mean, this went over 2,000 or nearly 2,000 miles in 90 days. That's a lot of mileage for a fish. Um, and it's things like this that always just get me super excited. And like I said, these are things we learn all the time. Um, now, what I was talking before, I'm going to show you an example of how some of these fish uh, actually move. So this is another option. So I was talking about the traditional tags, these tags that are, and I'll show you in a second again, that are relatively inexpensive that anyone can purchase. But this is another option. This is, we also have satellite tags that we put on just like on, um, just like with the traditional tags, the, the cheaper tags. And this, these tags allow us to see a lot more, allows us to show, um, it shows us the oxygen level, where they are, the depth, how fast they're going, a, a whole host of different things. And right now I'm gonna show you one of the tags uh, that I was really lucky enough to be a part of. Uh, this was a couple of years ago and it, we just were able to do some, some work on it and actually uh, show it to some of our partners. So you are one of the few to actually see this now. So this originally started and tagged right off here, right off the Gulf of Mexico, 150 miles offshore. And you can see it's not going a straight line, is it? It's going all over the place. But as you can see with the study and the research that we're doing, you can see that it's really going in certain areas and really around that warm area of those eddies. And those eddies being certain areas of where the currents are going. And um, typically that's where a lot of their food are. Um, and it's really, really neat. This, this was over a year, I believe, that this fish was on there. But you can see it goes all over the place. Uh, these satellite tags 
are a tremendous tool for us, uh, but it's not a substitute for the other tags that I was showing before. The reason being is that these have a, um, these have a, a short time frame that they can be used, while these tags, the traditional tags, can be used forever. Uh, not only that, but these tags, while super cool, also cost five thousand dollars each. Um, and these tags, the traditional tags, cost three dollars. So there's a big, big difference. So we don't have the opportunity to deploy these as often, but when we do, obviously, as you can see, you can see where these fish are going. It, like I said, it's awesome. I always love seeing this. I always love seeing where these fish are going because you never know um, where these fish are going. We're always learning new things about him, uh, which is awesome. Now, um, last but not least, I wanna talk about one of our last campaigns. I was, before I was talking about our Cornerstone campaign, but this is our, our new one that we're talking about. And I, I say, oh, baby billfish. It's our juvenile billfish project. And this is a baby blue marlin. Crazy, isn't it? For me, it's always amazing to see how small these fish are. And I'll show you some even smaller once this presentation is over uh, live as well. They, um, we are doing this juvenile billfish project so we can learn more about them. Right now, we are asking people to submit any pictures they have of, uh, of baby billfish whenever they encounter them. And all we need from them is a picture, a date, and the location of where they caught it. This allows us to see and understand when they were babies. You know, we still don't know a lot about them. Like I said, we're still learning a lot. We don't even know a lot of where they spawn or where they reproduce. So the more data that we can get about this, the better. Um, now, here's a picture, like I said, of a baby blue marlin. But can anybody guess on the chat? what the picture on the left could be and the picture on the right could be. Um, these are also baby billfish, in my opinion. Um, and they are found, and these pictures were actually taken this year off of Florida. I'll give you guys um, about 10 to 15 seconds to guess. Um, I will give you one hint. It is not the same fish as the previous, okay? So let's see. Very good, Aaron, on point. Again, left is definitely a sailfish because anybody know what the one on the right would be? It is not a sailfish and it is not a blue marlin. I'll give you five more seconds. Huh, spot on. <laughs> well done, guys. Well done to both you guys. Aaron, yeah, very good. Hassan and Patricia, very good. I wonder if you guys maybe have saw our, our, um, our posts on both of these, but these are amazing. These were found right off here, uh, off, of, off of the Florida Straits, and it's really amazing to see. And this is, like I said, all of this conservation effort and all of this research is based off of the general public helping us. Because um, without that, we wouldn't be able to get all this great information. Now, how does this all help? All of this helps because it provides us basically proof of what's actually happening out there, what's actually being seen, and helps us better manage the species, um, as well as gives us, how should I put it, uh, allows us to manage and protect the resources that are important, the water, the habitat, the community, um, and really indirectly that helps all of those people that are dependent on it, um, from uh, the people that are going fishing for them, to the captains, the mates, the hotels, to all those people. Think about all the people that come down to Florida. A lot of people come down to Florida to fish. And if we didn't all know this information, who knows what would happen? So we provide a lot of this information analysis to help, um, to help the species, to help the community. Also, I like to think it's, knowing that you're doing good. Um, it's being a part of something bigger. Um, and I like to think, you know, down when you get down to it, people want to do good. And that's what our, that's what our, um, that's what these two programs provide. Now, if you want to learn more, please go to our website, 
uh, please check out our social media pages. Uh, we're on every single one, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Check out our YouTube page. If you want to learn how to tag properly, you want to learn about some of the things we do, um, you want to listen to some of the aspects of what we're trying to do, you can go on there. Or you can contact me at this email, tag at billfish.org. And with that, um, I'm all done, but I'm open to any questions uh, that any of you have. Peter, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. As you said, we're going to transition over to our Q&A portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. If anyone tuning in has any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box and I'll ask on your behalf. Uh, just to jump right into it and get started, Mark notes that most billfish tournaments are catch and release for all but potential tournament weight winners and would like to know if killing these larger fish significantly impacts the breeding stock. If so, should all fish, billfish tournaments be catch and release? That is a great question. I think you said his name was Mark. That is a great question. So um, there is a limit um, to for anglers, the recreational community, and these tournaments to harvest fish. And the uh, and I'll, I will say this: it has never been reached, which is great. And as I was saying before, the um, these fish, there's not a lot known about them. And what happens within, the, within these tournaments, not only does it support all these communities and all these other things, but it supports the scientific community as well. Um, when some of these fish are harvested, um, scientists are there and they actually, it's actually really neat to see doing like the full on um, dissection of it. They take the stomach, they look at the gonads, which is the reproductive parts. They take a look at how old by looking, um, they take a look at how old these fish are by looking at the otoliths, which are the ear bones inside these fish. So every single piece of the fish when harvested is utilized. Like I said, unfortunately, these are not like tuna or mahi-mahi. These are not things that we know a lot of and we're constantly learning things about them. So these tournaments are important, not only, like I said, economically to these communities, but also just as important scientifically because we don't have a huge data set. Think about it. If we were just learning about them 20, 30 years ago, when other species have been learned, you know, have been studied for many, many, many more years, um, we are a little bit behind. And so these tournaments uh, provide a sample essentially for our scientists um, to learn more about, and maybe not our scientists, but billfish scientists, excuse me. So that is a phenomenal question. Uh, and the, just to add on top of that, I'm sorry. Um, I've been known to, to talk a little long-winded sometimes, I'm sorry. Um, one of the other aspects though, is to understand that when a, when a billfish uh, tournament reaches a certain limit of fish, typically they're done. They typically, most of these tournaments do not harvest more than, I want to say, at, you know, on average, maybe three fish, sometimes zero fish, sometimes a little bit more than that. But I can guarantee you all these tournaments, one, have to report it to, to the federal government. But then, like I said, they're all used. Everything is used later on. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Joseph, who asks, how and where are you most likely to find baby billfish? Absolutely fantastic question. Um, I wish I knew, to be honest. Uh, no, but uh, no, they're, they, you can actually find them right off here, off the Florida Straits. It's, it's really cool. And actually, that's a great segue. I have been very lucky to know a bunch of colleagues of mine that, um, that did some plankton toes, uh, which I'm not sure if you know, a plankton toes basically dragging a net through the open water. And um, they were able to give me some samples of baby billfish. And I know I told you that these fish get to, you know, over 12, 15 feet in length and nearly 2000 pounds, but they start out as plankton. Now I'm gonna see if you can see this, but right there, I hope you can see it, right by my thumb, there are actually two Marlin, <laughs> baby Marlin, they are not alive, but just to scale, look at how small that is compared to me. I'm six feet tall and 175 pounds. <laughs> These guys are less about maybe two millimeters. 
and they can grow to over 12 feet and nearly 2,000 pounds. It boggles my mind every time I think about that. Think about if you as kids, as students could grow that large. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. These fish, like I said, never, never cease to amaze me. There's so many really cool aspects of this, of these fish and this family of fish. Thank you again. We probably have time for just one or two more questions. Our next one comes from Aaron, who has a student that grew up in Jupiter and says, after sailboating tournaments, the student has seen a lot of dead sailfish. Um, he thinks this is due to the tournaments using J hooks and the fishing tournaments uh, should be circle hooks only. What do you think? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's federally mandated that I'm curious uh, where that was and when that was. Uh, the, um, excuse me, billfish tournaments have to use circle hooks unless they use um, uh, lures. And that's because circle hooks, um, and that's a great question, circle hooks are more likely to get hooked on the side of the mouth rather than uh, with J hooks sometimes uh, if you were to use a uh, natural bait, a live bait, uh, they would be stuck on the inside. So that's interesting. I would love to hear more about when that was. Um, and just because I see it really quickly, I'm going to let you guys know a lot of these fish, depending on the species, can live to over 30 years. And just for you guys to understand, some of these granders, some of these fish that are over 12, uh, over a thousand pounds, that's why we call them granders, they are over 20 years old. Um, and those are like, I think Mark was asking before, those are your females. Females are typically in the fish world are your, your bigger fish uh, and males will be around um, 300, uh, basically about 300 to 350 pounds max. It's the females, we call them big fat females, fertile females, boffs. Um, and they really help to uh, make, the, make the species uh, uh, propagate, excuse me. And I think we just saw he wrote in, it was a couple of years ago off of Juno Beach. Okay, I, will, I would definitely be open to taking a look at that. That's, that would be very surprising at this point um, and heavily penalized, <laughs> so. All right, so we'll wrap up with just one more question. Um, our next one is from Thomas who says, hunters are an important part of the balance of deer populations in certain regions and wonders if there's a similar comparison in the fishing world. That is a great question. And we get, um, we get tied in with uh, uh, hunters all the time. Um, think about it this way, uh, anglers and hunters, we, um, we love to fish as obviously we're anglers, um, we're fishermen. We love to fish. So we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot, right? We don't want to harm the resource. We want to make sure that this resource, these fish are out there forever. Um, so we want to do all we can to make sure that this fishery and this community is something that's there forever for everyone to experience, especially here in South Florida, we are spoiled. <laughs> we have so much, uh, so much really good fishing from inshore, offshore, near shore, um, freshwater. I mean, there's everything. Um, anglers and hunters provide essentially the first line of defense. We are a big, um, we are conservationists at heart to where like I said, we don't want to shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot. And really it's not shooting ourselves in the foot. It would be actually almost like shooting ourselves in the stomach or the head. And we obviously don't want to do that <laughs> for obvious reasons. The, the aspect of making sure the resource is there and protecting and conserving and promoting that resource for forever and making it thrive is the cornerstone of why our foundation was, was established. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and to learn from you. So we really appreciate your time and for you joining us this afternoon. At this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Stephanie to wrap up today's talk. Thank you, Brian, very much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us as Brian said, and a special thank you to Peter. Uh, we really enjoyed the talk today and for you to take the time to share your scientific research with us. Um, if you'd like to take a look at the extension activities for K-12 resources that are available, you can do so by visiting um, our websites, our YouTube channels, along with the recording of today's session can be found at UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. 
And again, please take a moment to complete the survey. It's been placed in the chat box by our team. Uh, we would certainly be grateful for that. And then finally, um, our next Ocean Expert Exchange event will be live on April 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be joined by Jessica Pate of the Marine Megafauna Foundation, who will be talking to us about her exciting research on manta rays. Um, living just off of the East Coast here in Florida. So be sure to check out Anjari and Sciences in Every Florida School events calendars for more information on that and other upcoming events. And we hope to see you there. To learn more about Scientists in Every Florida School and the Anjari Foundation, you can again visit our website, follow us on social media. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and we look forward to seeing you next